The following is an edited recording from a live video broadcast. Image and audio quality may vary. Uh, myself and a whole bunch of dudes ran a convention uh, called Con 9 for Matter Space, and it was a one-off event. It was a weekend devoted solely to classic golden age cinema, movies, TV shows, and even radio plays uh, from back then. Uh, we had so obviously some people dressed in costumes. We had some displays and some robots and all the rest of it, So, which was absolutely fantastic. But the thing that we did, uh for the event um is that prior to the convention occurring we put the word out to all these people and we said okay name your top five sci-fi movies and we um got all those numbers together and we did a panel at the end of the convention discussing the top 20 right so this is what we're going to do tonight right so it's actually the top 20 classic uh sci-fi films just movies from before 1965 number 10 what would it make number 10 do you reckon it's got to be something cool and of course it was when worlds collide bellas is coming to earth mate gonna completely destroy the planet zyra is just up the road chuck some dudes in a ship and off we go right uh and of course the thing that is makes this film so grouse and I'm going to say this about every movie, right? So just get used to it. Right? What makes this movie so gross is it shows how people deal with crisis. And they go, yep, we're all taking the lottery tickets. We're going to get on the ship and we're going to bugger off to Zyra. All great, all wonderful. And, of course, right as you know, Ballas is about to hit, everything goes to the shit house. Everybody wants to jump on the ship. Even the bad dude, uh, the guy in the wheelchair who's a complete arsehole, is funding the whole thing, right? Uh, society just collapses and falls apart. And that's exactly what would happen in real life for those um, who would know about this stuff. So it was really echoing what could happen here uh, if such a thing was to occur. And we've seen other movies like that in this you know, in recent years, like 2012, and just recently even um, uh, Don't Look Up and all the rest of it. So, But even when, when worlds collide, there's a lot more under the surface than, um, than what you see from, uh, from day one. Um, and another great movie, absolutely, they're all great movies uh, in their own way, Mr. Ange, so there you go. Uh, Gavin, yeah, music for When Worlds Collide is great. I mean, what a great title, When Worlds Collide. I mean, that, that alone is just like, oh, I've got to check that out and see what happens. Now, physically, you don't, if I recall, you don't actually see the actual Earth getting destroyed, but it does. It doesn't end well for planet Earth, what can I say? And, like, in later versions of this, like in 2012, they're sticking in all the animals and they're doing the whole arc thing and all sort of bizarre. But, of course, I guess in this story, they don't have a lot of time to think about it and they just send them all off. Um there you go. Uh, when Will when Will said George Pell to his bride, yet more dialogue from uh, the Rocky Horror Picture Show, science fiction double feature. Absolutely fantastic. And, of course, when Rocky Horror Picture Show was being made in the 70s, these movies only came out like 15 years prior. So they were still relatively fresh in people's minds, which is kind of groovy. So there you go. Um, the funny thing about this particular movie, when worlds collide, is the ship takes off, right? It's a fantastic visual effect. Lands on Zyra, which is in the bottom right-hand corner. And even I picked up on this. I go, hang on. There's actually like civilizations there. What's the deal with that? So you got look, looks like like a oh, man-made pyramids over there, and you got this city thing over here. And as it turned out, apparently they had actually produced proper like Chesley Bonestell once again was going to do the background art for, work for it, but they ran out of money and they just had to stick in this like temporary image. And of course, that kind of cocked it up because one, it wasn't painted properly, and of course, on the big screen, this thing was enormous, uh, and it showed a civilization there. So uh, the our, our human people have just rolled up on Zyra thinking, oh, grouse, here we are. We were the first humans here. It's like, hang on, there's all these other dudes living here. And if it's a scenario like the recent movie, Don't Look Up, these things just come out and eat everybody. Well, that's the end of your movie. Isn't it? <laughs> Let's think positive. What can I say? So there you go. Oh, here we go. Uh, Rusky Babes, Con 9 Fun Factoid. We've got plenty of those on. Cecil B. DeMille was going to make When Worlds Collide in the 30s originally. So, uh, oh, that would have been pretty groovy. Cecil B. DeMille, of course, was a famous movie director. So, uh, well worth checking out. So, uh, you're right, Ange. It is an invasion from Earth. Imagine those people in those buildings thinking, Oi, a ship's just landed here. What's the deal with that? What's the deal with that? Who are these puppies? You know, uh, but uh, let's not worry about that. We move on, shall we? So, um uh, there was a sequel book called Afterworlds Collide. Uh, yeah, well, you do wonder what happens. Anyway, it wasn't meant to be that way. I think the intention being that Zyra was meant to be an unpopulated place, but the picture clearly shows civilization there. And, of course, no one in the cinema thought, let's not worry about it. It's all good. The young people have turned up, and the world is good. How groovy is that? All right, now, number nine. Oh, now, yeah, this is a popular one. Me made, remade as a modern-day movie was complete tripe. Didn't need it. And of course, the original, you can't knock it. We're not going into the 50s. We're heading into the 60s for this one. Of course, it was the time machine. Good old Rod Taylor gets in a machine, and he jumps off 50,000 million years into the future, mate. Meets the Eloy and the Morlocks, 
Yay team. And of course, he plays good old Herbert. Well, I think it's George Wells in this case. They didn't want to call him uh, HG Wells. Uh, Herbert George, they just stuck to George, I think it was. So a lot of people love this. And of course, there's a lot of uh, fascination in the time machine itself. And people have built replicas of it and, you know, all this sort of business. And even Big Bang Theory, there's a classic episode regarding that. But what a great movie when you sit and think about it. And we had discussed this in Sci Fi Zone. Um, like a few months ago about, you know, if you're in the machine and you're traveling, and of course he physically sees time changing in front of him and uh, how that would work. Cause he obviously, as he gets further into it, like after the third world war, he gets covered in molten rock and he has to keep going forward in time until all that breaks down. And of course, by the time he does that, the entire world is completely different. That's where you got the Eloy and the Morlocks and all sort of business. And uh, it was particularly grouse. And, uh, um, yeah, and I really appreciated that. And of course, okay, they got their facts wrong. There was no World War Three, but in the fifties with the Cold War and all the rest of it, you know, you can understand they weren't very optimistic about everything. But then he comes back, picks up his books. What three books would you pick? And off he goes back to the back to the future, uh, as it were. So you um, you can't say no to that. So yeah, it was very groovy. And of course, yeah, with the Morlocks eating the Eloy, that was so like, wow, we didn't see that one coming. And you're right, Rusky Babes, it was shocking. Some of the, it's just people didn't see that coming at all because they got the Eloy on the top the young, blonde, good-looking young people, but completely oblivious to what's going on in their surroundings. The siren goes off. They all walk down like zombies underground, and uh, it doesn't end well. Start chowing down on some dudes, as you do. So, uh, And if you wanted to be a little bit um, anal about these things, you go, well, who do the Eloy represent in modern-day society and who do the Morlocks represent in modern-day society? I'm sure you could pick out some very, very good uh, choices for that. Uh, Rod uh, Taylor was brilliant, absolutely fantastic um and uh yeah so uh oh yeah we're not talking about remakes uh no, chris made a point about the remake no we're not talking about the remakes we're sticking with the originals original is the best that's the way it goes um and that's right so the, the sequel video this was actually done on a documentary um for the movie and it was done about 10 years back and they actually brought back uh rod taylor uh and alan young yep that's right and it was actually a sequence where um wells returns after 30 something years and because they're playing the ages that they were at that point um i can't remember what it was maybe 15 20 years ago now it's a very very short sequence it only goes like five or six minutes if i recall it's right in the middle of the documentary so it's just like it's not even a special um segment and uh, they come back and they're older man and um, they have a bit of a conversation about how, what's going on and, and Wells explains how things have been going in the future. It's very, very cool, very groovy, something a little bit left field, but I don't think many people saw it. So, uh, But if you get a chance, check it out. So, But, yes, The Time Machine, excellent movie. And, uh, yeah, there's very little about it that you could you could fault, uh, I've got to say. So love it. Uh, well, yeah, Adzi, and that's the case with a lot of these things. A lot of the remakes are not necessary, but they do happen. Having said that, there is a remake coming up in the very next one, number eight, which was actually uh, on par with the original and is a personal favour of mine. And this one I did actually have to vote for. Uh, was, of course, The Thing from Another World. Absolutely love this movie. The coolest thing about The Thing from Another World, um, because it was a Howard Hawks production, is that all the characters talk over the top of each other. It is so true to life. So it's not like a lot of movies where... You know, character A speaks and then character B speaks and character... You'll actually have two characters talking here, two characters talking there. It is so natural in the way the dialogue is presented. And, it, I mean, it takes a bit of getting listening to... You have to listen to it because, obviously, the microphones are picking up the different um, um, speeches. But it is so realistic because, typically, when people are talking, if you've ever been to parties, you'll have two people talking here and three people talking there, and that's what they do in this movie. And it just has a beautiful flow to it. And what one of the key things is is that obviously there's hardly any females in it. There's actually a woman in the movie, but she's not a scream queen. She's not a damsel in distress like a lot of the movies were at this point. She's actually a strong person, and you can really sort of dial into that. And, of course, you've got the scientists trying to um, keep things sort of hidden away, and he's vegetable-based in this particular story. And, yeah, it's a dude in a suit, you know, Desi Arnaz Jr., whatever, whatever. But it was really, really groovy. And I saw this as a little kid in the 70s, right? It was on TV, so you got the movie. The movie only came out 20 years prior. And at the start when the thing is uh, run off in the snow and the dogs chase him uh, and they bite his arm off. Oh, that scared the shit out of me. I had to go to bed. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't watch anymore. It's freaking me out big time. But once again, it's that whole claustrophobic what's going to happen scenario. Where is the thing? Who's it going to kill next? And uh, absolutely spectacular. Yeah, by today's standards, as I said, you see the creature and you go, yeah, okay, it's a dude in a suit. But 
the principle behind the story is good and the characters are spectacular. Oh, I can't speak highly enough of the thing. And that was one film when they did do the remake in 82. Absolutely thumbs up. Absolutely loved it. So, yes, so that's the thing. The thing from Another World uh, based on the Who Goes There uh, story from... Ah, uh, shit, I forgot who wrote the story now. Somebody out there will know. But uh, hmm, very, very cool. Find this thing in the block of ice. It's a spaceman from another planet. And the goods have got a, a, a news, news reporter there. He wants to go back and tell his story. And they say, no, nah, you can't do that because uh, they don't want worldwide panic. And, uh, yeah, very, very good. So if you get a chance, check it out. Absolutely loved it. All right, so that brings us to what's number seven. We count them down now. I mean, the top three or four, you're probably going to be able to figure this out, right? So there you go. John Campbell who wrote the book. Thank you. Very good. Uh, who goes there? Thank you. I knew somebody out there would know. Now, this one that's coming up, right, This the other version of this was done as a farce, and it was, like, really disappointing. But this particular one, they said, all right, if you try to do it seriously, let's take it, like, right to the nth degree, can it work, right? Can it actually have the impact that it should have? And for the, and I saw this at the Valhalla, and this was a magnificent film. And, of course, it was The Incredible Shrinking Man. Now, the key thing with this is the character, Scott Carey, when he starts to shrink, I mean, visual effects, notwithstanding, I mean, there's some stuff that worked really well and some stuff that didn't, but because they, they did the whole thing in miniature, yeah, he's uh, like having really oversized props and all the rest of it. They tried to take it seriously. If you start to shrink, what happens to your world? And, of course, in the story, uh, the wife thinks that the cat has eaten him, right, which is in the sequence in the top there. But he hasn't. He's ended up in the basement, right of the place and of course as he's getting smaller and smaller he's trying to work out how to get out of the basement and he's got the big props and all the rest of it and of course one of his foes is a spider and the sequence between him fighting the spider it's a real spider right and of course in his scale the spider is gigantic and i remember seeing this in the cinemas and people who were like um uh acrophobic no ac what do you call it when you're afraid of spiders is it acro acrophobia yeah uh this thing's gigantic and you go my god this dude's got to fight a spider and he has to do it to survive and the key thing is he keeps shrinking he keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller and i loved it because they took it seriously they didn't take it as a joke when they did the incredible shrinking woman with lily tomlin 20 30 years later that was just done as a joke and he's like no was it yeah it was the yeah lily tomlin movie that was just done as a joke but this one was done really seriously and uh and i had to really respect them for that so uh yes Good stuff. You've got to check it out. Um, oh, Elf, just watched it again last night, as you should, old son. Uh, yes, it is well worth checking out. As someone said, the only downside with some of the visual effects when he's running across the carpet with the cat, there's no shadow and all the rest of it. Yeah, you've got to, got to deal with it. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Gavin. Arachnophobia, yeah, because they made a movie about that. Um, so, yeah, and that's the thing. He's got to survive in his world, and it becomes his world, and that's the key thing about it. And, uh, yeah, it's it's just something different, something you wouldn't expect. And, uh, yeah. Love it. So, uh, yes, the Lily Tomlin movie was a big flop, as uh, I can completely understand that too. So there you go. Uh, yes. Fantastic. So if you had a chance to see The Incredible Shrinking Man, you got to see it in the right mindset. Don't look at it as like, oh, how are they going to do visual effects and how's it going to look? You take it seriously. Go, okay, how, how does this dude deal with Because he narrates his whole way through because he's him by himself. He has to explain what he's doing. The wife thinks he's dead. And, of course, he's not. He survives and he just gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And steps. Oh, absolutely spectacular. So there you go. All right. Uh, I like this one from Jeff Rowe. Yeah, the director went on to bigger and better things. Yeah, Brady Bunch and Gilligan's Island episodes. Well, hey, they were successful in their own right. So uh, maybe from his perspective, it was a huge jump up in his career. So there you go. All right. This one, now we're getting to the stuff that you got. You know, I love this. I saw this as a kid and it gave me effing nightmares. Absolutely shit myself, right, when I was a kid. Of course, it's the blob. Mate, how good was this? The thing crawls up the dude's arm, you know, and he can't get it off and he's shaking it off and it can encapsulate, encapsulates him. How friggin' scary was this friggin' movie? And um, I got to absolutely love it. Now, of course, Steve McQueen was in this, and, of course, at this point he was known as Stephen McQueen because at this point he was a nobody. And even today, and I was discussing this with someone just the other day, the colonial cinema in the town, which I think still exists every year, I think it was every year, I don't know if they still do it, they used to have a running out of the cinema moment, right? So because the blob invades the cinema and they all run out of the colonial and it was, it was a bit of a, a like blob fest type of thing. And... You're right. <laughs> yeah, you're right. The theme song, yeah, okay, the theme song was a little bit comedical, you know, by Burt Bacharach, but um, <laughs> it did affect jelly sales. But the thing is, it was damn scary because you didn't know, you couldn't work out what it was, um, and it would just take people over. And, of course, in the cinema, 
when it just comes through the the projection booth and you go oh my god this thing was freaking awesome and uh and and to be fair even the remake in the 80s was very very good that was actually frightening i've got to say so um oh my god elf was watching this just two nights ago what are you doing mr elf you live in con nine from outer space in your bloody house or something mate so how grouse is that so um uh and mr vile saw this at con nine yeah it creeps etc and it does and of course in the end it's like how do you kill it and of course they drop it off in the antarctic because it doesn't like cold weather but of course the funny thing about this story it was one of those movies in the 50s where it's like the adults don't know anything it's up to the teenagers to save the day right the kids know shit right uh you know, adults there yeah, the police and the government allow they're all they're all, all a bunch of knobs but the kids know all and of course Stephen mcqueen and his droogs they go yep we're gonna go and fix the day and uh and uh, alert everybody to the problem that's going on regarding the blob and it was just a magnificent magnificent scary movie and as i said as a kid shit myself it gave me nightmares i was afraid to have my arm out on the side of the bed that night thinking the blob was going to come up and eat me and all sort of bizarre so yes there was a sequel son of blob and believe it or not they made another movie called beware of the blob and it was directed believe it or not in the 70s by larry hagman good old jr ewing himself i think it was his one and only direct direct debut beware the blob in the 70s why would you bother stick with the original so uh yes exactly right love it next up we count down from number five to number one 